The president of Iran is under growing pressure over the sharp drop in the country's currency. Is the Riyadh's fall being caused by Ahmadinejad's economic policies? Or are Western sanctions to blame? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. Riot police in Tehran have fought with protesters angry over the sharp fall in Iran's currency, the rial. Hundreds of demonstrators turned out on Wednesday to demand the governor of the central bank step down. They also accused President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad of financial mismanagement. The rial has fallen to a record low against the U.S. dollar in recent days. Ahmadinejad blames U.S. and EU sanctions imposed against Iran because of its nuclear program. He calls it an economic war. Everyone is aware that foreign trade and commerce don't have a very high share in the Iranian economy, but the figures are being used in the psychological war for a greater effect on the markets. The number of U.S. dollars being exchanged in our country is not that big. Well, the rial has fallen in value by about 40 percent over the past week. The drop is being blamed on domestic mismanagement of the economy and Western sanctions. A year ago, it cost about 12,000 rials to buy one U.S. dollar. But this week, in just three days, Iran's currency dropped by about 20 percent. It hit a record low of more than 37,000 rials for a dollar. That means the Iranian rial has lost more than 75 percent of its value in the past year. So what really is behind the latest collapse of the Rial? Joining us to discuss this from Tehran, Mohammed Marandi, Associate Professor at the University of Tehran. In London, Babak Emamian, Chairman of the British Iranian Business Association. And in Brussels, Joshua Goodman, Communications Director at the Transatlantic Institute. Let's begin in Tehran. Professor Marandi, the president of Iran, calls it a psychological war that should be blamed on others. How much should he be blamed for the dramatic devaluation of the Iranian currency and how much anger is directed at him in Iran? Well, I think part of what he says is true and part of it is uh, really uh, mismanagement. It's somewhere in the middle. Obviously, uh, the United States and the Europeans have been trying hard to make ordinary Iranians suffer. Uh, the objective of the embargo and the sanctions on the Iranian central bank are to prevent Iran from even importing uh, food, rice, uh, and medicine. So the, but they haven't had the effect that the Western countries want them to have. But on the other hand, uh, the Iranian, uh, the current administration, uh, in the eyes of many economists, have uh, made uh, mistakes. Uh, there have been contradictory statements over the past few weeks over uh, government policy, for example. And uh, there's also been a policy over the last 10 years, the uh, last three years mostly of, the Mr. of Mr. Khatami's administration and Mr. Ahmadinejad's seven years in power of um, inflating the strength of the Iranian real, propping it up. And uh, the, the gap between the real value and the value promoted by the government was just too much. And also, as I said, the sanctions did have an effect. So the currency did begin to fall. Joshua Goodman, the president, though, even though some in Iran blame him uh, for mismanagement of the economy and for this drop in the value of the rial, he blames it on those psychological factors, on external factors, uh, saying that uh, pressure from the West as well as currency speculators were chiefly responsible for the current situation. People are on edge psychologically, aren't they, in Iran? Well, let's just start with, the, with President Ahmadinejad's response. Very simply, he's deflecting. A lot of responsibility, as Dr. Mirandi said, does fall on his economic mis mismanagement. And he's trying to put the blame elsewhere. I mean, you know, suggesting that other hands, foreign powers are at play. You know, this is reminiscent of sort of, of what we heard from the foreign minister of Syria at the United Nations General Assembly last week when he said the opposition, really, any opposition to our regime is coming from foreign influences. You heard it in Libya from Gaddafi. I could go on and on. It's, it's very typical for sort of authoritarian leadership to, to respond this way. Um, you know, sanctions you deny, though, are sanctions playing a role, are that's a for impact. sure. I, look, sanctions are having an impact, the extent to which is, is very difficult to judge. And I do need to correct one thing Dr. Mirandi said. The sanctions are not preventing 
the uh, entrance of medicines and food to uh, and basic supplies to Iran. That's that's completely unfounded. In fact, you know, if just sitting here in Brussels, Europe, despite having very strong sanctions against Iran, still has very high levels of trade. Uh, it, it's only on. Uh, technologies that relate to the nuclear program and on oil and in the energy sector. It, that's that's where the sanctions have primarily been focused. It is sanctions are the, having an impact. It is impacting the, so the, is, the import of goods, isn't it? Let me let me allow Professor Mirandi to respond. Well, obviously, when you try to shut down the Iranian central bank, the objective is to prevent Iran from importing any goods. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's medicine or if it's food stuff or it's machines. Not only does it make it more expensive because the Iranians have to use mechanisms outside of the banking sector, it makes it also less reliable. And, uh, and, uh, and, and at times, many companies just refuse to engage with some companies inside the country because of, of, of fears of the money going through or not. No, there is no doubt if one looks at the WikiLeaks documents, uh, even before the recent sanctions, from the very start, uh, the objective was to hurt ordinary Iranians. And with the United States trying to prevent Iran from selling oil is, to, is in order to hurt the economy, to create job losses, to impoverish people, to make people dissatisfied. But it's quite brutal, and I think it only creates uh, greater hostility towards the West in Iran and outside of Iran. So to, to claim that uh, it doesn't have an effect on the imports of food, I think it's, it's uh, unrealistic. And I think one should be more honest about what the objectives of the United States and the Europeans actually is. Babak Emamian, what is for you the main reason behind the Rial's dramatic devaluation, the government's economic policies, or these stifling US, EU sanctions? government economical policies. And I agree with uh, Dr. Marandi, but I go further back. I think the cause of all these miseries is because of the exchange control that was imposed at the beginning of Iranian uh, Islamic Revolution. Now, what uh, the death knell of any economy is when you impose exchange control, because you introduce black market economy into, econom into any system in any country. And it starts with its currency. So immediately after the exchange rate uh, exchange control was imposed, there was a black market currency uh, uh, introduced into the Iranian economy. And then that introduced other black market into other aspects of Iranian economy. But the main blame, I don't blame it on uh, Dr. Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, but I blame it on the central bank of Iran, because it's been pursuing policies where it has propped up riyals, as you said, only, only to help the importers, not the exporters of Iran. It's been uh, the central bank, I would go as far as accusing them being in the pocket of importers of Iran, Iran who are mainly the Bazaris, and against the manufacturing, against the exporters, against anything to do with uh, actually encouraging growth in Iranian economy. But what can the central bank do, uh, Mr. Imam Yan? In, in the face of the recent measures that were taken less than a year ago, uh, we had these financial banking section, sanctions imposed by the United States. Initially, there were sanctions on trade. Those did not seem to have very far-reaching uh, effects. Then it appears that the administration went for the jugular, imposed these banking financial sanctions. Iranian banks can no longer uh, transfer money because of the entire system being pegged the way it is to SWIFT which is uh, controlled by the United States, this uh, international transaction uh, system. How can Iranian banks then operate? If you're talking policies, the first thing they have to do is allow the real to float. Uh, we have to, once you allow the Iranian real to float, actually you're opening the Iranian books. It's exactly what happened to Greece. When they entered Euro, their books were opened up. And the first, first time you could actually see the weakness in their economy. And once you allow the real to float, you actually are indirectly opening the Iranian economic books. So you could actually see what are the holes, what should we do to improve them. The other thing which you mentioned is political a little bit. You, you are absolutely right. Uh, and that is we have, as Iranians, to get our relationship with Western economies sorted out. We cannot continue this hostility. It's not helping anyone in Iran. Uh, Joshua Goodman, uh, for the economy to function properly, 
doesn't it have to rely on small, medium-sized businesses' ability to be able to, to trade freely, to flourish? Can this happen with the kinds of uh, steps that the United States has taken? And isn't it then holding hostage an entire population because of the policies of its government or in some cases even its perceived intentions? The question is not, you know, does the responsibility lie on the United States or on the European Union? The responsibility lies on the Iranian government to adhere to its international obligations concerning its nuclear program. That is the reason, and that is the single reason, why there are sanctions against Iran. The Iranian government to date has not made a genuine offer. It's what the European Union is waiting for and why it has continued in its negotiating process. But even the letter from the three foreign ministers from France, Great Britain, and Germany to their colleagues made clear that to date, Iran has not put a serious proposal on the table. And as such, they have had to continue with economic sanctions as a mean of, means of pressuring the government. Well, the nuclear now, the program if, is if no doubt Iranians important to the to West, develop... but isn't it also being used as a pretext to bring about regime change in Iran since 1979? Hasn't the West adopted several measures, sanctions and the likes, against the regime, uh, overt, covert measures to, to try to undermine that regime? Well, as I'm sitting in Brussels, I can, I've never heard the European Union put forth a regime change policy. It is not in the common foreign policy. It is not stated in, in the conclusions from the, from the EU foreign ministry gatherings, and there will be another one in two weeks where I'm sure they will strengthen sanctions. The focus of the sanctions and of the round of sanctions that we are talking about right now is to stop Iran's nuclear development and its pursuit of a nuclear weapon. Mohammed Mirandi, by creating those kinds of economic conditions within the country, the U.S. And, and the EU hope, don't they, perhaps, that uh, the government will face the very kind of internal upheaval it may be facing today that could lead to its demise. Just how threatening is the situation today for President Ahmadinejad? Obviously, it will not bring about the de demise of the Islamic Republic. The Islamic Repub Republic has a very uh, large amount of legitimacy, and I think it has uh, more legitimacy than many of the European governments right now that are uh, in serious trouble in southern Europe, uh, even by European standards. Uh, it's wishful thinking on behalf of the United States and the Europeans that that would happen, but I agree completely. That is the objective. It is to hurt ordinary Iranians, to make them suffer, in order to force about a significant change in Iranian foreign policy and even bring about what they like to call regime change. But the reality on the ground is that it's not the Iranians who are to blame with, with regards to its relations with the West. Western regimes are not, first of all, the, a representative of the international community. If you look at the non-aligned movement, which represents three-fifths of the international community, they actually support Iran's foreign policy and specifically Iran's nuclear program. So uh, Western hostility is basically because of Iran's independent foreign policy and to be honest, uh, with, it is because of Iran's opposition to apartheid in Palestine. The Iranians are, see Israel as uh, exactly, almost exactly the same as apartheid South Africa, as a racist regime. And this is something unacceptable to Europe and the United States. But at the end of the day, the only way forward and the only way towards rapprochement is for European countries to recognize Iran's nuclear rights and its rights as an independent country. And then I think the Iranians will m be quite willing to be more open about their nuclear program if there are any serious concerns. Joshua Goodman, is this kind of approach a constructive one to get Iran to be more transparent about its nuclear program? And just leaving aside the economic, social, political impact of these sanctions, what is the legal basis for such a wide-ranging sanctions policy? Well, Iran has... has uh, has set its own standards for its obligations to the international community regarding its nuclear program through its signing of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the legal grounding for this is in the, is in the Security Council resolutions passed through the United Nations. Uh, you know, this, the sanctions program was put in place quite simply to, as a result of, la as a last resort, because Iran had not acted in good faith, had not been transparent. Mm -hmm. If Iran wants the sanctions to end, they have to halt their, their uranium enrichment, and they have to make their program completely transparent. They have not done it to date. May I respond? Uh, you know, the EU has never denied 
No, can I finish my point, please? The EU has not denied Iran's right to a civilian nuclear program. In fact, I, I've seen statements that, that affirm it. And that's the same thing that the non-alive movement affirmed. They did not affirm Iran's right to nuclear weapons, which is what the international community is objecting to, because there are concerns documented by the IAEA that Iran is developing the components needed for a nuclear weapon and is in pursuit, perhaps, of that objective. And that is what what the EU is concerned about, and that is why the EU is acting, and that is why the U.S. is acting, why the international Marandi, community is acting, and is not this. driven by any other factor than that concern. I think your guest knows that he's being misleading here. Uh, first of all, the uh, non-aligned movement supports the Iranian nuclear program as it is, and it has never expressed concern that Iran is pursuing nuclear weapons. And this is, uh, if if you can find that anywhere in their statements, I would be very glad to to see it, and I will change my stance. Uh, the EU, as uh, you pointed out, contra in a, you made two contradictory statements. Well, on the one hand, you said Iran must halt its nuclear enrichment, and on the other, on the other hand, you said that Iran, the EU is willing for, uh, to allow Iran to have a nuclear program and enrichment by extension. The Iranian, Iran has never been in breach of the non-proliferation treaty. This is a fact. There is no evidence with regards to that. And there are two sets of sanctions that we're talking about here. One is by the UN Security Council, which is not a democratic body. It's a dictatorship of the powerful. And on the other hand, there are sanctions that are much more extensive, being imposed by the United States and its Western allies, and not only against Iran, against countries that do trade with Iran. In other words, the United States and the Europeans, and especially the Americans, are dictating terms to Korea, to India, to South Africa, to Brazil, which is uh, extraordinary. It is a, a very uh, hegemonic and imperialistic attitude. Well, well let's just take a look, uh, should we, at this stage, uh, at the United States uh, reaction to what's been going on in Iran in the last few days. The U.S. Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton has acknowledged that sanctions have contributed to Iran's economic problems, but she also says that those sanctions could easily be lifted. I think the Iranian government deserves responsibility for what is going on inside Iran. Uh, and that is who should be held accountable. Uh, and I think they, they have made their own uh, government decisions having nothing to do with uh, the sanctions that have had a, uh, an impact on the economic uh, conditions inside the country. And of course, the sanctions uh, have uh, um, had an impact as well, but those could be remedied uh, in short order if the Iranian government were willing to uh, work with the P5 plus one and the rest of the international community uh, in a sincere manner. Mr. Imamian, just looking at the first part of what Hillary Clinton said, that the Iranian government essentially should be held responsible and accountable. It's made its own decisions that have nothing to do with sanctions. Really, can the Iranian president make any significant economic decisions that don't take into account the economic impact of sanctions? Y yes, and, and what I have to say is what the argument that Dr. Marandi has, philosophically, it's right and it's very beautiful, but we have to be realistic here. 80% of the world inventions come from the United States of America. 80% uh, of world wealth is controlled by the top G20. So it doesn't matter if you have friends, uh, you have 180 countries who are friends, but if they are poor and they are weak, they are no useful to you. you ha we have to get real about life here. We cannot deal without having a proper relationship with Western economies. Yes, but, we, but the question as, is as about nation, sanctions. Uh, to what extent do they impact well, this is, Ahmadinejad's ability that, to, to deal with the current economic situation? Well, his hands, or he claims in, in recent interviews, and others have claimed that they have tried to actually uh, have this relationship uh, improved so they could have you know, uh, economic uh, prosperity from these countries and have a better relationship with these countries. So that, that's, the, uh, that's the problem they have. That there is this block in Iranian politics that wants to stop any relationship with Western economies. and. Uh, the, their idea is our independence. Now, I have to say, I know something about independence. Independence is about having money in your pocket. If you don't have any money, you have no freedom. Money means freedom. The reason why people in I Iran are coming to the streets, because their buying power is decreasing. That means their freedom, their, uh, their, uh, uh, the, the, the ability to buy, purchase things, to buy things, to improve life, is diminishing all the time. 
So we don't only have political freedom, we have economic freedom. And in the debates that you have in Iranian politics, nobody talks about economic freedom of Iranian people, which is continuously diminishing for the last 33 years. Uh, looking at the second part of what Hillary Clinton said, Joshua Goodman, uh, she admitted that sanctions were having an effect, saying that the situation could be remedied, quote, in short order, essentially if the Iranians showed uh, what she called uh, goodwill and a genuine interest in negotiations on Iran's nuclear program. So is this all about Iran's nuclear program, despite uh, some of what uh, Professor Marandi alluded to, the fact that uh, Iran has indeed um, signed up to the NPT and respected some of his, uh, its obligations under this treaty? I mean, to what extent is the U.S. pushing a bit too hard? Because Iran, after all, is uh, a liberal economy. There are private businesses, and a lot of small private businesses are uh, hurting as a result of the financial and uh, banking sanctions that have been imposed by the U.S. administration. Well, this is about the sanctions. This is, or is about the nuclear. The sanctions are about the nuclear program. It is, as you said, um, and that that is the focus of the sanctions. The troubles with the Iranian economy are, as as my colleague in London said, they have um, they, there are various factors, including economic mismanagement. You know, Dr. Morandi won't discuss the, the the lack of transparency in the Iranian economy. The fact that the IRGC controls uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps controls a very big chunk of the economy um, and that that does create some of these problems I mean if we look back at the at the fall of the real over the years you could see the diminishing value well back past 10 years before the sanctions on um, regarding the nuclear program even began inflation has for as long as I can remember as long as I've been following the issue been in the 20s 30 percent same with unemployment these are you know the consistent um, maladies of the Iranian economy and this is the this is the reality itself so you know putting the blame on sanctions is a way of both deflecting economic responsibility and the international responsibilities but, but concerning could the, the US, nuclear program. Could the U.S. be taking this too far? Because its sanctions not only prohibit U.S. corporations and entities from trading with Iran, but foreign companies that do business with the United States are also prohibited from trading with Iran. Isn't this taking it a bit too far, trying to circle the Iranians and their economy from every conceivable angle? Well, it's not cir circling them from every conceivable angle. Iran still has trade, as I said, even with the European Union. Uh, it, you know, they still have, on a bilateral level and, and on a multilateral level, at a, you know, the numbers are, are quite significant. What the U.S. is doing is ensuring that companies that they deal with don't violate what they perceive to be the right economic code of conduct with Iran. That's that's their uh, that's their prerogative, and that's the position they've taken, and they're doing it simply because of Iran's nuclear program. Mohammad Marandi, Iran's nuclear program, the, with the accumulation of sanctions, where does the government find itself? Is there more anger at the government for its continued policies that are used to justify the sanctions, or more anger towards the West? Where does it stand today? Well, I think there's a a, a lot of anger ab about uh, the current uh, policies, uh, currency policies imposed by the government in Iran. You can see it in Parliament, in the media, and, uh, that I'm, and that's a good sign. The head of the Speaker of Parliament is uh, a, a harsh critic of the President, and uh, that, that is how uh, an open society works, contrary to the misleading picture that we usually get of Iran in the West. Contrary to what your previous guest said, I was the first person actually to say that the current situation is a combination of both uh, the uh, uh, inhuman Western sanctions and mismanagement in Iran, whereas he, he seems to like to say that the United States is a benign regime. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, the United States is, is going to hurt itself more than anyone else because most people in Iran do acknowledge, do believe firmly that the West and the United States in particular are out to hurt ordinary Iranians. As I said earlier, the WikiLeaks documents from the past show this, and current policies prove this. At the end of the day, this uh, government is accountable to Parliament. And uh, in the coming days, uh, supposedly, uh, the government is going to uh, initiate new policies with regards to uh, the currency. As your uh, Iranian guests rightly pointed out, uh, the Iranian currency uh, has to uh, be at a rate that is acceptable to exporters. If the government gets this right, if they play uh, a reasonable game, uh, a lot of good can come out of this in the long run. But uh, inst currency instability is something that they have to resolve very quickly 
because it hurts ordinary people, but that does not absolve Western regimes for their actions against the Iranian people. We'll have to wait and see how the situation develops uh, over the next few days. But for now, thanks very much to all of our guests in Tehran, Mohammed Marandi in London, Babak Imamian, and in Brussels, Joshua Goodman. And thank you, as always, very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. You can always send us your feedback, your thoughts, your comments at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. From me, Rida Fakhri, and the entire team here in Doha, thanks for watching.